Our guest today is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the McCormick Foundation. He is the past President, Publisher, and Chief Executive Officer of the Los Angeles Times. Prior to that, our guest today was President, Publisher, and Chief Executive Officer of the Chicago Tribune Company. He earned his bachelor's degree from Harvard College and his law degree from Harvard Law School. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the City Club of Chicago, David Hiller. David? All right, thank, thank have you. Fun up there. All right. Thank you, Jay Doherty. I was actually thinking of trying to become the publisher of the New York Times and make it a trifecta, but I don't, I don't think that's happening. Uh, great to be here at the City Club. Good to see uh, all of you. There are even a few people here who are not grantees of the McCormick Foundation. <laughs> nice, nice to see you also. Actually, as you'll hear about, I did invite a number of our grantees, and I'll tell you why in a little bit as we get into this. Um, it's a real pleasure to be at the City Club, so aptly named. Jay, you turned this. This is clearly one of the preeminent public forums in the city. And I especially want to thank you for inviting me to be the closing act of your uh, season. I was sitting next to Father Ryan, and he said something about whether this was like the Last Supper. <laughs> and I had absolutely no idea how to respond to that. <laughs> In any case, this is uh, great for me to be here. I am a uh, Chicago kid. That's uh, me and my brothers. I don't know if you can tell who I am. This was starting out on a lifetime of broken dreams. <laughs> and I, I still wear those PJs. I uh, went to Maine Township High School out in Park Ridge, but far better known for graduates Hillary Rodham, Harrison Ford, and Steve Goodman, another long-suffering Cub fan. And uh, but I've been back here pretty much since law school except for two adventurous years I had, as, the, uh, as Jay mentioned, as the publisher of the Los Angeles Times. We probably have some other pictures at some point during this time, but <laughs> when they said I was so cute. <laughs> Leave it on, that's right. Uh, I lasted uh, almost exactly six months with Sam Zell until uh, we decided, actually he decided, uh, that uh, we would go our own ways. I have to tell you one other quick story. The day Sam, it was, it was like two years ago now to the day, Sam called me up and said, I want to see you in my office. I said, all right. So I had a couple days to think about what it was, including fielding a call from the Wall Street Journal, another, another great investigative media. I called up and said, is there any truth to the rumor that you're about to be fired as publisher? <laughs> I said it would be news to me. <laughs> we'll see. Any case, then, in that context, when Sam invited me to his office, I had, uh, I, I wasn't really sure what was going to happen. But my mother, bless her heart, that m many of you have, have met, called me up and said, well, Sam probably wants to make you CEO of the whole company. <laughs> and uh, again, for those of you who know her, know now where I get my optimism. <laughs> In any case, I'm now completing my uh, almost exactly first year as president of the McCormick Foundation. When I uh, told somebody I was going from the newspaper business to the uh, foundation world, they said, well, how does it feel moving from one nonprofit to another? <laughs> Only kidding, Tribune people. The, they'll get the first question. They will actually say they're making barrels of money still, right? Fewer than we did, but still good to hear. Any case, um, enough about me. Uh, so let's talk about our foundation. Uh, our foundation was created by Robert R. McCormick, who was the longtime publisher and editor of the Chicago Tribune. And Jay, I was trying to tell, isn't one of those guys over there you? Over on the right? You were, you were probably, that was the cornerstone setting. In any case, Colonel McCormick built up the paper. He moved Tribune Company into what were then the two new media of his time radio, and then television. And he left all his money to the charitable trust that became our foundation. And he left his property, 
in uh, Wheaton, Illinois, in Trust Forever for the People of Illinois, Cantini Park. And I have to ask, how many people here have been out to Cantini? Oh, well, that's pretty good. <laughs> so you may not need the c discount cards <laughs> that I put at everyone's place. But if you, if you look there, there's a, uh, uh, you become your official Cantini Advantage member. No free golf yet, but uh, plenty of discounts to other things. And, and uh, we hope if you've been there, come out again. We've got uh, great programming, including on uh, July 17th, we've got Gary Sinise and the Lieutenant Dan Band doing their uh, concert in support of veterans, which is a dear cause to us and, and the community. So come on out and go to that. But uh, we'd love to see you out there. So um, why would we still talk about McCormick, and why would we do that here at the City Club? Well, there are some historical parallels, actually, uh, beginning with, if I can quote from the website from the City Club, when the City Club began, it operated amidst adverse social and working conditions and a notoriously corrupt political system. <laughs> The City Club took a leadership role in working to improve these conditions. Well, Jay? <laughs> it's good we're still in business. <laughs> anyway, about the same time McCormick was getting his start in Chicago, although first as a public citizen, even before he was a newspaper man. Not a lot of people know this, but in 1904, a year after the City Club was founded, McCormick was only 23, and he won a bid to become an uh, alderman from the 21st Ward. And actually, a year later, was elected president of the sanitary district, which at the time was thought to be a festering swamp of patronage, inefficiency, and corruption. <laughs> Hearsay. 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 Yeah. <laughs> I don't know whose quote that was, actually. But he also got into some great battles with uh, Samuel Insull, who was then the head of Commonwealth Edison, wanted to put hydroelectric dams and block up all the rivers in and around Chicago. In any case, that was the uh, kernel. Now, a lot of things are better than they were in 1903, but some things aren't. And in fact, I'd, I'd say in some ways it's not an exaggeration to say that Illinois borders on being a failed state. And the, uh, as many of you in the room know, the recipe for doing this is, is pretty well known to us. Widespread public corruption, a gridlock government that can't decide the people's business, basically bankruptcy at every level of government, and a public that's increasingly frustrated and disaffected with what's going on. Now, in 2009, there's a civic health index released that was done by the National Conference on Citizenship which Congress charters to do this, to track civic health across America, and it ranked Illinois 40th out of 50 states in terms of overall measures of civic health. And, and part of that one fact that just kind of jumped out, only 15% of people in Illinois said they believed that state government did the right thing most of the time. Now, the good news is that this city and this club and this very room are filled with people who are committed to making things better in our city and state. And I'd like to talk about some of the work of some of these people, uh, which we're very proud to help support as part of our mission. And the work I want to talk about falls into three main areas, and they intersect. One is education, both during the earliest years of childhood and then throughout one's lifetime. Second, access to community news and information that people need to make a city and state better. And third, opportunities for all of us, but particularly for young people, to uh, be engaged in the civic business. So, as many of you know, having a strong community starts with education, including in the very earliest years. Research shows that the early years after birth are a key time for brain development and also the early development of, of cognitive and social skills. Unfortunately, research also shows that by the time a lot of kids get to kindergarten, they're already a grade or two behind. And by the time they get to sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, they can be three, four grades behind. And even more uh, terribly, 
it's disproportionately true for the least well-off, the uh, low-income and, and minority kids particularly. And the long-term costs of this, both to the kids and the society, is staggering. It's, uh, some have called it an assembly line to failure, in some cases all the way to prison. Now, some of the effects you don't see until middle school or on into high school. But the thing that's known, we know it's rock solid proven that the, that the groundwork for a lot of these problems we later see is what happens or, or unfortunately doesn't happen with kids when they're real little. Now the good news is we know how to address these early childhood needs and have been making a lot of progress thanks in major part to uh, some of the people in this room and Illinois has been a, in a leader and we have the right agenda. We know what to do. And, and even in this environment, we've got to stabilize funding, increase kids' access. Still something like half or more of the kids in the state don't have access to quality preschool programs. Part of this is improving the standards and, and putting money into professional development, both teachers, principals. And uh, as I said, we've been making progress on, on all these fronts over the past decade. The real bad news is that with the budget crisis, we're losing ground, and a lot of this progress is being put in jeopardy. And it's still a little unclear what's going to happen for sure in this budget year, but, it, but in all probability, not only will preschool for all, the main Illinois program, not be fully funded, but funds are probably going to be cut. And if that happens, as a result of that, thousands and thousands of kids who had just made it into good preschool programs are going to be thrown out of them and we're going to lose that ground. Even worse, with the millions of dollars of unpaid bills from the state, a lot of the key um, agencies doing this important work may have to either way cut back what they're doing, or some of them may have to close their doors and go out of business. And if we dismantle all the work and this infrastructure from these groups that's been built up over the last decade, it's going to take years and years and years to get it back. So we're lucky in the city and state to have some great leaders and advocates working in this area as they have for years. And to set the stage before introducing them to you, I want to show you a brief video that will give you a little feel for some of the work and the kids they work with. This one from the Ounce of Prevention Fund. I want to be a nurse when I grow up. And I grow up and be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a policeman. A teacher, that day. A dinosaur. I think sometimes people just don't realize what they can do or what they can achieve. You have to know yourself that you can dream in order to share that with your child. To let your child know that there's something better, there's something different. I want to either go into social work or become a teacher myself. I see this having legs. I see children who are in second grade, third grade, after having the benefits of you know, this early intervention, really doing well. There's a way to change the cycle, but you have to start early, which means right after they're born. You can't wait. You have to do it you know, now. So please join me in thanking our early childhood and K-12 education leaders who are here. And if you'd please stand as I call your name, Diana Rauner, Executive Director, Ounce of Prevention Fund. <laughs> Kathy Rigg, Gaylord Gieske, Vice President. Kathy Rigg, President, Gaylord Gieske, Vice President, Voices for Illinois Children. Robin Staines, Executive Director, Advance Illinois. Robin and Ceci Nyman and Jim Alexander, Illinois Action for Children. Thank all of you for what you do. So I know many of you are deeply involved in the K-12 issues that we face. But I'd also like to talk about one area of learning that doesn't get as much attention, but bears directly on the conversation we're having today about the state of civic health, and that's civic education. One of the original purposes of public schools in America was to, was to bring kids along and turn them into great citizens. And I don't know how it was when you were growing up, but in my middle school and high school, we had a lot of great classes in the Constitution and the government and learn things and uh, try to get also get us out of the classroom and do things around the community. Unfortunately, that in many, many places, that's not the way it is today. 
eight years into the uh, No Child Left Behind world, which brought an intense focus on standardized testing in the areas of math and science. The social studies have been increasingly neglected, and our school's civic mission has been all but abandoned. Now, given the political challenges and the other issues that we face, we think it's very, very important that we reverse this trend and get quality civics education back into the, back into the schools. Now, there's some good news from the Illinois Civic Health Index that I talked about earlier. In spite of all the problems and the depression over things, the overall state of affairs, there was strong support among people in Illinois for improving and expanding civic education, include, including building quality service learning as part of the uh, school curriculum. Last year, the McCormick Foundation and the Illinois Civic Mission Coalition co-produced the Civic Blueprint for Illinois High Schools, providing uh, guidelines for teaching active citizenship to uh, our students. And this Civic Blueprint has now been endorsed by the State Board of Education. The democracy schools that are part of this blueprint are accredited high schools that, that promote civic engagement and have a strong program in, in civic education, including fostering uh, direct involvement in the community. Now, there are eight of these democracy schools around the state so far, but we believe and hope that that number is going to grow significantly. Now, members of the Civic, Commission, Civic Mission Coalition are here today. They've actually been holding their own strategy planning meeting upstairs. What a coincidence. <laughs> and came down to, to join us for lunch. So would all the members of the uh, Civic Mission Coalition who are here today please stand? <laughs> now one of those uh, members, John Schmidt, is a member of this uh, coalition. And John is also head of the Office of Social Studies and Service Learning in the Chicago Public Schools. John's recognized nationally as a real champion for his leadership in civic education and, and service learning. One of the CPS programs is, in, uh, is their Civic Leadership Camp, which is a three-day program to help get CPS students to get ready to be citizen leaders in the future. And we're lucky enough to have a group of those students here with us today. So John, could you and your group of future leaders please stand and be recognized? Kent, students. Thank you all for being here, for sure. And good luck with, good luck with camp. John, thanks for what you do. One more initiative we're adding to this effort earlier this month uh, the McCormick Foundation launched our Freedom Express, which is a mobile interactive experience. They told me not to call it a museum because that sounded boring. <laughs> so it's not a museum, it's a mobile experience. <laughs> and, it's, and it's great. We were going to have it here, but Jay wouldn't, let, Jay wouldn't give us enough parking passes to fill the lot across the street. It is going to be out at, at the Chicago History Museum on July 4th. So you can see it there and it's, you can look for it. It's going to be all over. It's cantini on a lot of the weekends when you get out there. And I don't know if some of you had been to our, the physical Freedom Museum when it was in, in Tribune Tower, but um, this is the next generation of that. And what we found was in these uh, this, uh, day and age, it was getting harder and harder to get teachers and classes down into downtown Chicago. So we decided to do the reverse and get our show on the road and take the story of the First Amendment and freedoms and how important they are even today uh, out to the kids and students. So also look for it at fairs and events near you. <laughs> so the uh, second area I wanted to talk about was ensuring that our communities have access to the news and information they need. You may all be familiar with the Thomas Jefferson quote uh, that if he had to choose between having a government without newspapers or newspapers without government, he wouldn't hesitate to pick the latter. Now happily, because of the efforts of many of the journalists in this room, we're not yet faced with dealing with government without newspapers or news media in Chicago. 
and congratulations on the work. And I don't know if there are sometimes people here. I think that the, our local uh, media has, under these extraordinarily trying circumstances, done an exceptional job of covering the core key issues of corruption and the fiscal budget crisis. So hats off. Hats off to you guys. Keep it up. Keep it up. So since you've got all that taken care of, I thought rather than talk about the supply side of news, we'd talk a little about the demand side. Now, if you've noticed, kids are not sitting around wringing their hands over the twilight of print media. But they're completely immersed and indeed bombarded with all of this new digital media, including social media of their own and others making. So this new world gives, raises really big questions about how people, especially young people, receive and, and use all the information, including the overload, coming to them from all these different directions, and how they decipher what's news and what's noise. So there are a number of agencies, groups in our city, working with young people and to both teach them some of the skills of storytelling and, and media, and also providing them with insights into what journalism really means. And we're proud to work with several of them, and I, I want to mention two specifically. Uh, one is the News Literacy Initiative, headed by Alan Miller. Alan's a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter, formerly with the Los Angeles Times. The News Literacy Project kicked off in Chicago last year. In the first year, the project reached almost 500 students in four public schools, some of the LISC organization uh, public schools who partnered in the program. And uh, a number of our news organizations, including the Chicago Tribune, NBC, WBEZ, and Univision, are participating in this, having hands-on help and, and coaching for the students on uh, real live issues of journalism in the classroom. It's just terrific. Thank you so much for participating in that. The objective is to get kids to think critically about news and information and what you heard about, what's credible and what's not. And, uh, and the value to them and to the community of being able to understand and tell their own stories. Here's one thing. Courtney Smith, who's a 14-year-old student at Rivas School on the Chicago South Side, summed it up this way. I don't forward emails anymore because if it's false, I don't want other people to believe it. How about that? How many people do I wish would do more of that? Huh? <laughs> she says, I also check multiple sources for accurate information. My goodness. So, anyway, that's the, what a, what a novel idea. But anyway, that's some of the tangible progress in the promise of this, uh, of this uh, program. Alan Miller, stand up. Thanks for getting this program going in Chicago. Alan, where are you? Hey, Alan, Alan's over here. On the... There are other groups like Radio Arte that give students the opportunity to learn directly how it is to be a journalist. And, and create their own media. Radio Arte is an initiative of the National Museum of Mexican Art and is a bilingual, youth-driven public radio station. It promotes socially conscious journalism, provides media literacy training, and creates programming that's not always available over the traditional media. It's a really great program. Let's let one of the Radio Arte students share her own story with you. Radio Arte is, is, is like a second family for me. Uh, it gives me a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of confidence in my life. Uh, it's a great experience that we've gone through, and I'm 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 really glad since the beginning that I, you know, got involved in it. And I actually, and I'm sort of very experienced, and I can do journalism, and I can speak on the radio, and I can inform people. So it's something really great. It's not just like oh, you're on the radio, and that's it. You know, it's really, really, really great. And I think that we can just look for opportunities and see what's out there. So Jorge Valdivia, the general manager of Radio Arte, was not able to be with us today, but let's thank them for the work they're doing. Uh, finally, let me return to the subject I talked a little about in connection with civic education, and that's what we do to get uh, people engaged off the sidelines and into taking action. And importantly, uh, too, starting with kids building a lifelong habit of being involved in the important issues in their community. Several of our partners, and again, some of them here today, are doing some extraordinary work in building this commitment to action on the part of our uh, children. 
Uh, one is Interfaith Youth Corps under the leadership of Ibu Patel and Rich Van Hees. Rich is here, Ibu couldn't be here. It's a youth-led, Chicago-based international organization that brings together people of different faiths in service to their community at the same time in an effort to break down divisions that grow up between people of different religions. We got the DePaul University Stain Center, led by Howard Rosing, works with community organizations to create community-based opportunities for learning and social action from, uh, from students at the university level. Uh, Darlene Rossitti, who's the regional superintendent of DuPage Office of Education, is one of the passionate advocates for civics education, and she's a member of the Civic Mission Coalition and has, has helped lead the growth of the democracy schools in DuPage County. There's City Year, led by Lisa Morrison Butler, who have the, one of the most inspiring mottos I've ever heard, give a year, change the world. And they actually do that. And they unite young people of all backgrounds for a year of full-time service in communities. And they've graduated nearly 800 core members and helped nearly 10,000 children through their mentoring and tutoring program since they got underway in 1994. And finally, under the leadership of Brian Brady in the Mikva Challenge, working to develop their next generation of young people as leaders, opportunities to participate in the democratic process, shape policy, and actually be out and get things done in their communities. Today, Mikva runs, I think, eight civic programs and serving over 5,000 high school students in the state. And I thought here, too, it's always best to let these students speak for themselves. Having a strong impact on the issues and understanding so that we can relay them back here in Chicago. I wonder if I can ask you a few questions about this year's election. Would you say you're strongly supporting Kerry or just leaning towards it? Where's the president? Where's the president? Yeah, I did phone banking, I did canvassing. I learned that campaigning it takes dedication, dedication, and hard, hard work. It can make you realize that you can make a difference and it's fun, it's not boring. <laughs> this is once in a life. Well, yeah, once in a lifetime. I mean, I don't think I'll ever be here in New Hampshire again. So this means uh, the world to me. It's very important to know the issues because just because you're a Democrat don't mean that you can always have to vote for Democratic views. You can vote Republican because if that person goes with most of your views, you need to support them. Democracy is a bird. Would all of you uh, leaders of the civic uh, organization I just mentioned please stand up and be recognized? Yet with all the excellent work being done with our kids throughout the city, it will mean little or nothing if we can't keep them safe, indeed keep them alive. Their safety and security is the precondition for any hopes they'll ever have. Dealing with the problem of gun violence in our communities just got more complicated with Monday's Supreme Court ruling. What we know is that there's a constitutional right to keep firearms in your home for self-defense. But we also know that the court made it clear there's significant room to have local regulations tailored to local conditions that can uh, um, regulate the ownership, use of guns, and that can be uh, tailored to local conditions to make sure that our communities remain uh, safe. And uh, fortunately, we've got great leaders in the city like our mayor, who's been the most relentless champion for sensible uh, gun policies of anybody in the country. We've got people like the Ellen Albertine and the Joyce Foundation who have been leading the policy work in that area for years. So hopefully at the end of this we're going to come up with a workable approach that does the best we can do for the people in Chicago, particularly the kids, to keep them safe. Bruce, if I can borrow from here, I, th I thought the closing passage of yesterday's Tribune editorial was right on point. It's one thing to lose in court. Chicago has to win the daily struggle on its streets. The mayor and his allies can no longer count on the handgun ban, but they have plenty of other options to reduce the bloodshed. So I want to mention, in terms of pursuing those options, uh, the work of two organizations who are helping to fight this fight. 
One is the University of Chicago Crime Lab, which began in 2008 in partnership with the city of Chicago. The Crime Lab, uh, it's a very interesting group, seeks to reduce violence but actually helping figure out what works and what doesn't, doing evaluations and evidence-based study. It's amazing that after so many years of being at the problem of gun violence, there's a lot of mystery still about what kinds of things can actually have a good impact in reducing the level of crime and, and violence. And as part of this work, the Crime Lab Chicago Youth Gun Violence Initiative recently launched a pilot program that's using sports and related mentoring to work with several hundred at-risk kids in 14 Chicago public schools. Jens Ludwig, who's professor at the University of Chicago and the director of the lab, uh, couldn't be here, but I believe Rosanna Ander, who's the director of the lab and, a, and a, an alumni of the Joyce Foundation, I believe. Rosanna, are you here? Can you stand up? Thank you, and thank you and Jens for your work. The second organization, Cease Fire, is an innovative and evidence-based strategy to reduce shootings among the highest risk individuals in our community. They do this through a combination of intensive street outreach, conflict mediation, community mobilization, and public education. And through those efforts has reduced um, shootings by an average of 28 percent in some of Chicago's highest crime neighborhoods. Ceasefire is now in 16 neighborhoods and has already this year performed 263 interruptions of potential violent incidents. Maywood, interestingly, just had, this is a impactful. Maywood just had a year without a homicide, and it had 20 in the year before Ceasefire started its work. Ceasefire is also now working with 15 other cities in the U.S. Here's a short video clip that will give you a sense for their work. Right now we're standing on the corner of 66 and Bishop Street in the city of Chicago, you know. Growing up here, it's basically just trying to survive and stay alive, man. The situation that happened in my community, you know, on my block, a couple of guys pulled a couple of pistols on me and my buddy. I wanted to come back and retaliate with a gun, but one of the members of Ceasefire helped me resolve my situation without violence. Probably saved my life and another life, you know. Gary Slutkin, who heads up the uh, ceasefire, and his colleagues T.O. Hardeman and Josh Grinowitz are here. Guys, can we stand up? Thank you for your work. In, in closing, I want to return to a question we talked about at the beginning. How do we make sure that Illinois is a great state, not a failed state? We talked some about what are three of the pillars, good education system, the vigilant press, citizens getting the information they need, and a culture of being engaged and helping solve the problems in the community. But another fundamental requirement is having a political system that works. Free, open, democratic, effective institutions that are responsive to the people. Nothing else is going to be successful in our public life of our community if we don't get this right. And this is another area where we have much work left to do. I think everybody in this room knows what needs to be done. We need to finish the work on campaign finance reform that was started, progress was made. We need to fix the legislative redistricting process to take the control away from the legislative leaders and put it back closer to the people or ind and independent commissions. We now know that, we, that the current constitutional system won't be changed for next year's redistricting. But the process can still be a lot better. The legislature can still provide for more public input, more transparency on the map drawing process. And we in this community can and should stand up and insist that this is done. And then also come back, whether it's next year or the year, and fix the system by finally changing the state constitutional provisions on redistricting and getting them right. Well, I want to recognize and thank the people in this room who have been doing a lot of the heavy lifting in trying to fix both the political and, and fiscal problems. And uh, here are some of their organizations. And if you'd stand and 
when I call your name, Lawrence Massal with the Civic Federation. Lawrence. Cindy Canary of the Campaign for Political Reform. Cindy here today. Uh, George Ranney, Paula Wolf, and their colleagues at Metropolis 2020. Paula. All the members of the Change Illinois Coalition. Andy Shaw and the Better Government Association. And of course, the League of Women Voters. So we are the ones, all of us together, all citizens, we're the ones who share the community, we share the common challenges and the opportunities to get these things fixed. Jay, I want to thank you and the City Club for inviting me today. I want to thank all of you for being out here, and I especially want to thank all of our partners who do the inspiring work out there every day. Thank you very much. Paul, well, I think if I timed this right, I used up all the time for questions, so we'll, oh, right? Got, I have some in advance, sir. Yeah, uh, oh, advance ones, all right. Uh, we may have to go over some of the Colonel McCormick stuff. Uh, uh, <laughs> only tangentially can I get in trouble, but uh, when he worked at the sanitary, when he was on sanitary, he, he met somebody that was very influential for the Tribune, a, a noted reformer, a guy named Ed Kelly. Uh, <laughs> but it was honest and clean government all the way through. So uh, here we go. If you have, if you have questions, uh, Ginny's there and out back there, raise your hand. Uh, I know a lot of you have already stood up and you've already got your RFP, so you don't even want to worry about that, but <laughs> is that right, Ms. Paula? Uh, yeah, fine. Okay, from Joy Saxon, uh, uh, from the uh, board member. The July 4th hist uh, History Museum speaker. Uh, um, are you speaking, by the way, there? Yes. Well, this is gonna be a- But it will be a different speech. <laughs> oh, we know that. What will your patriotic message be? Yeah, how about a little sneak preview? Well, that's a great question, because the next thing we do as soon as we go back from here is try to go, go start working on the speech for the fourth. <laughs> but what I actually think we're, I'm going to talk some about is the, um, the role of citizen soldiers in the defense of freedom. And I've been back reading some history and fourths of July, including an amazing number of them that have been held either in the threat of war or during war, and the connection um, between what we celebrate on the fourth and the people who actually maintain that freedom and give us the opportunity to celebrate it. And so I was doing some reading about what Roosevelt was doing during World War II and, and right before it, um, and there's some interesting history going back, including at the Revolution, which is, you know, the, in the, at the first Fourth of July, we were in the middle of an undeclared war. Um, we hadn't declared until that day, declared independence. There had been battles and people killed beginning in, in uh, Lexington and, and Concord back in April. And it's, uh, but the, the story of our liberties is really the story of the people who protect them. And, but there's going to be a lot more on the 4th, so come out to the, and, and more than me, most importantly, so come on out. Okay. Uh, this question is from Christy Hefner, and Christy, I'm going to just paraphrase to the end of it. Uh, she, does, she does mention that Illinois is 40 out of 50 states. Of course, I interpret that as we beat 10. <laughs> Former state employees, you've got to stand up every once in a while, and, you know, we did beat 10. We don't like to know what those 10 are, don't we? Uh, the question that, that, that Christie has is, uh, what, would it, what would it take to make Chicago substantially a world-class city? You can do the whole state if you like. Well, let's just do one part of it. The, the analogy I want you to talk to is, why was it so possible for Chicago to become a world-class city? Because Chicago was a I was going to say all that, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> answer that question, will you? Jesus. Well, that was also better than the answer that I'm about to give. <laughs> Damn 
We're both stuck, Paul. Actually, I think, it, I think, it's, a, I think it's a great question. I think you, you do, though, see. The great thing about Chicago is that, it, as you point out, it does and can uh, come together for causes that it believes in. It's, it's been a little bit of a mystery to me why the uh, political corruption and the fiscal bankruptcy seems to float by without ex igniting a firestorm of reaction and demand that things get done. It just, I, it, I, I don't know what it is. It has to do with the, you know, the salience of political issues and, and where the energy for political organizing gets put. But um, from the role that we can play, and I know other uh, funders and not-for-profits, and I mean, it's all, this is one of those things, it's all about all of us. I mean, it's, it's sort of, why, it's like asking them, why are we all sitting here and not making these things happen? Um, I'm hopeful that the Change Illinois is going to continue to be a vigorous uh, proponent continuing on in doing things both that we talked about in connection with the redistricting as it'll happen. I think there is an opportunity to, to take an opportunity to go back and, and after the refinance and try to fix that, take the fu those political funding decisions out of the hands of the leadership. Andy Shaw is in the process of reinvigorating and has well done that already, the, the better government uh, association. We've got all the means in our disposal. We've got, we, you know, if, we, if people had done everything that the editorial pages of both papers had said done, we could go home and declare victory. So, you know, we've got, we've got good editorial coverage. We've got great investigative work going on to root out the problems. Now what we need to do is come together as civic leaders and build the coalitions and take the actions to get this stuff changed.